So I'd say hello to everybody. Uh, you're all more than welcome here this evening. Um, it's evening time here in Ireland. Um, and it's marvelous to see so many of our friends here with us. And um, tonight we are going to have an absolutely fantastic presentation. But before we start, um, I've got a special message for you from our president, Ricardo Gussi. Unfortunately, Ricardo cannot be with us this evening, but he says hello to everybody. He sends you all his best regards, best wishes. Um, and he's looking forward to seeing some of us in Asturias in Spain for Congress in a few weeks time. Um, so this evening we are joined by uh, a speaker from South Africa called Chris Fallows. Uh, I've been following Chris and his work uh, on Facebook, online, and I have seen presentations from him. And I know he is an absolutely fantastic photographer. And we are going to hear and see some fantastic photographs from him and hear some fantastic information about those photographs. Um, so we are in for a brilliant presentation and it's marvelous that so many of you are here and able to join us. So Chris, just so as you know, we have people from as far as being as Los Angeles, uh, from Chile, uh, all the way through to people in Bangladesh. So you're spanning the world, and sorry, and Australia, as well as South Africa. So you're spanning the world. Uh, so um, it's marvelous that you're here with us. And uh, just to remind people, uh, please to keep yourself muted so that we don't have any strange noise in the background. And if anybody has any questions for Chris, please type them into the chat. Uh, and I will ask Chris the questions at the end of his presentation. So uh, I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to hand over to Chris Fallows uh, and he will introduce himself and, uh, and, and start his presentation. But for those who don't know, Chris is a photographer. He comes from South Africa. He specializes in wildlife and the presentation this evening is called the fine art of nature. Um, and one of his big, big things which has made him very famous is that he discovered the now world famous breaching great white shark behavior at Seal Island in Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, and he spent thousands and thousands of days uh, on the ocean or on land uh, with these sharks, documenting and photographing them. But it's more than that that we're going to see from him this evening. So Chris, I'm going to stop speaking and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Paul, for that, that lovely introduction. Hello, everybody. It's a fantastic privilege to be able to talk to you all around the world. And um, I, I hope tonight to, to share uh, a couple of my experiences, uh, a couple of, of techniques and, and kind of just um, share how I got to the, the point where I've evolved a style that I, I'm pretty comfortable with now. But um, most Im importantly, to, to just uh, be able to share some of the journey with you. So without any further ado, let me um, start up presentation. I hope everybody, I hope everybody can see that. Um, yeah. Yes, we can. No problems. Great. All right. So how did it all begin for me? When I was a, a teenage boy, I was, I was very lucky to have a, a, a father and a mother who, who took me to a lot of Southern Africa's amazing game parks. And I developed a huge passion for nature from a very young age before becoming a photographer. And I think even to this day, first and foremost, I'm a, I'm a passionate naturalist and, and a conservationist at heart and uh, inspired by nature in all its different forms. But as a, a young teenage boy, I started a conservation project when I was about 17 years old with local fishermen who at the time were killing a huge number of sharks. And I convinced them to allow me to start removing these sharks from the net, um, returning to them to the ocean, tagging them and contributing towards research. And it was in 1991 that I, I, I was lucky enough to um, capture a, a small great white shark. This is actually a ragged tooth shark that we're releasing. But in 91, we, we captured a, a small great white shark and I took the, 
the, the information to a group that was working with them in South Africa. They were the first at that particular moment in time to be working with the Great Whites. And I started a volunteer position with them for four years. And uh, we worked on many amazing documentaries with the BBC, National Geographic, and many others. And one of which was with David Attenborough for a show for BBC called Wildlife on One Great White Shark. And in that, there was work being done off the Farallon Islands of San Francisco, where a scientist by the name of Scott Anderson threw a surfboard off the rocks and reeled it in, and a great white shark came rushing upwards and caught it in its mouth. And it gave me an idea in an area I'd been researching close to Cape Town called Seal Island to head it offshore at that stage, being a, a guy in his very early 20s. All I could afford was an 11 foot long inflatable boat, and I convinced three of my crazier friends to join me and we headed out to Seal Island and uh, I had a little yellow life jacket roughly the same size as a small seal and we towed it behind our rubber inflatable boat not really expecting much and literally within a minute of putting it out a great white shark came flying out of the water and my friends in the boat were part amazed part terrified two of them wanted to head straight back to shore but I convinced everybody that well let's give this another try and we tied the life jacket on again and we towed it for about probably another 25 minutes. And then a really decent sized shark came flying out the water. And we realized that not only had we discovered, you know, great white sharks, but they were doing something truly incredible. They were flying out of the ocean. And for me, this started the most amazing journey with these, these animals, where by 1996, I was heading out there on a more regular basis. We had saved up uh, along with a, a friend who was on the, the rubber boat with me to buy a small boat, and we were seeing incredible behavior. And as a photographer, this gave me unprecedented opportunities to really take photographs that, you know, just by my fortuitous circumstances, I'd been in the right place at the right time, but being iconic animals like great white sharks that, you know, capture people's imagination for better or for worse, um, were, were always in the newspapers. And in 2001, I took this photograph that uh, for me was a milestone in my career in, in, in that it, it really, uh, you know, catapulted me from, I guess, obscurity to suddenly this photo appearing all around the world on all the famous newspapers and billboards. And um, I realized just what a tremendous interest people had in, in sharks around the world. In the early days as a photographer, you know, initially it was all about action and capturing this incredible behavior that I was seeing, um, strong, powerful imagery, a lot of, you know, big in your face portraiture. But over time, that style would evolve considerably from the imagery that you see in front of you. Um, what I learned in those, those early years was to try and do things differently, try and embrace things in a way that a lot of people weren't doing. And living down at the southern tip of Africa, we, we blessed with um, a, an entire suite of different weather conditions, you know, as you can see over there. In uh, 1488, Bartholomew Dias, the famous Portuguese explorer, called the, the Cape Point or the Cape of Good Hope, Cabo Tormentosa, the Cape of Storms. And less than a century later, the famous British uh, navigator, Sir Francis Drake, called it the fairest Cape in all of the world. And indeed, it depends on which mood Cape Point is in that you, you actually ascribe the, these amazing different uh, and contrasting metaphors to. But what the Cape of Storms does give you is it, it gives you an, an amazing bouquet of different weather conditions to photograph in. And I was one of those people from the earliest of ages that really embraced the wildest of elements. And I, I always, in a lot of my photography, tend to head out when a lot of people are heading back in because I, I believe not only does that give you, you unique opportunities, but also creates a unique look and feel to your images. What I also realized, however, from the, the earliest of times is these hostile weather environments create optimal conditions for a whole suite of different wildlife and nature. And so by embracing these elements, heading out often during them or just after them, I got to see and have opportunities, you know, that I never really knew existed. When you get huge weather systems coming through and you have a lot of upwelling and meeting of, of currents and, and a lot of disturbance on the seafloor, it creates very productive environments that attract a whole suite of marine predators and, and, and different animals to feed. In this partic particular case, these blue sharks that are feeding on a, a ball of anchovies, 
And then in this instance, African penguins diving down and going looking for their food. But really, it was an amazing, uh, I guess, awakening for me just how important hostile weather or change in weather was to what I would find as a photographer out in those environments. I was very lucky in that uh, spent a huge amount of time on the ocean working with the great whites. My wife and I spent more than three and a half thousand days at sea. And, you know, purely by being out there, I was uh, availed to an amazing suite of incredible opportunities. Um, I was lucky that seeing, you know, sometimes thousands of dolphins became relatively commonplace. And you can only have so many beautiful jumping dolphin shots. So I started trying to experiment and do things a little bit differently and tried to capture uh, the images of these animals in slightly different ways. So in this particular case, um, slightly different to your typical split shot where you dip a camera half in the water and half out the water. What I learned through using a certain technique that allowed me to approach very close to these dolphins and at a specific point to the school of the dolphins, I could get them to track alongside the boat without breaking the surface of the water, which gives this almost glass-like effect where you look into, this, into the sea and it's almost like you're in the water and then contrasting that the dolphins out of the water. So you get the feel of being in the water and out of the water at the same time and then using graduated filters balancing the sky with with what is obviously a far darker element in the ocean so that was one of the the different techniques i started playing with and photographing dolphins and then you know just once again i had so many opportunities I, I wasn't particularly talented i just had opportunities in front of me all the time i would use techniques such as motion blur to freeze these schools and just offer a completely and and contrasting look to the typical flying dolphin, you know, beautiful portrait that, that most people, you know, who don't have that many opportunities take. What I also started seeing is right at the top of the food chain, certainly by size, maybe not by predatory nature, we, we started discovering areas where huge aggregations of whales were coming together. And in recent times on the Atlantic seaboard of uh, the South African coast, so the western side of, of South Africa, um, we have humpback aggregations coming together where you can get upwards of 200 humpback whales in small areas. And it, it was really up until the last two or three years, pretty much unknown. And my wife and I had once again, incredible opportunities to head out to sea. We designed a boat that allowed me to shoot from water level. So if you can imagine being on a, a high powered giant surfboard, that's essentially what our boat looked like, but really it gave me a, an, an opportunity to shoot at water level and make you feel as if you're in the water with these animals. What we also started seeing by heading further and further offshore was there's a whole suite of pelagic animals. Pelagic is simply the open ocean environment. It's a fancy word for saying open ocean. But in this environment were creatures such as these long fin pilot whales. We're coming across pygmy sperm whales. Indeed, full-grown adult sperm whales. Um, uh, um, uh, what else were we getting out there? False killer whales, a, a whole suite of different animals. And it was an incredible um, exploration, so to speak, you know, pull, pulling back the veneer of the open ocean. Through my work with the great white sharks and, and doing many different documentaries, I was lucky enough to have many different opportunities offered to me around the world. And one of them was to be part of a once every uh, decade albatross survey in a, in a remote island called South Georgia down in the, the South Atlantic. And it was really in this environment that I was introduced to one of the great creatures on the earth. And, and that is the wandering albatross whose wingspan can reach just shy of 12 foot in length. And really by learning a little bit more about this bird and seeing it in its own environment for me was, uh, it was just a breathtaking opportunity to see these masters at play in the most hostile of environments of the planet. In fact, the, the more violent and the more hostile it became, the more they reveled in that hostility and, and and I don't think there's been ever a truer word than what was said by a famous American ornithologist Robert Cushman, Cushman Murphy 
who said, I've risen to a higher standing amongst mortals because I've seen the albatross. And to see, the, see these birds with those huge wingspans dynamically soaring off 20 foot waves and you know, having the ability to circumnavigate the globe in less than a month was for me, not only a, an amazing thing to see, but an incredible privilege. Heading down into the Southern Ocean, I, I got uh, amazing exposure to other animals that we don't readily see on our shores. And in this case, the largest seals on earth, the Southern elephant seals, which can weigh up to four and a half thousand kilograms. They attain lengths of close to five meters. And I spent a lot of time with these animals battling during mating season, where only 2% of, of them will actually ever reach full adulthood. And uh, it was incredible to see these gladiatorial contests play out before my eyes. Photographically, I tried to shoot this in a slightly different way. Um, I, I love the feeling of creating these, these backlit sort of uh, uh, style to the imagery. It, uh, it adds a certain artistry to it and it's just a different look. But to be quite honest, South Georgia is just such an extraordinary place that I think if you went down there and you closed your eyes and you held a camera out and you spun around in 360 degrees, you'd take beautiful photographs. Such is the, the degree of uh, the bountiful amount of life that you see down there. There are more than 40 million seabirds, 4 million subantarctic uh, Antarctic fur seals, 600,000 elephant seals, and just scenery to, to die for in every single direction. Many people have said to me, if you could choose one place to spend the last few days of your life, where would it be? And I'll have to say, certainly photographically and from a natural history point of view, it would be on a beach called St. Andrew's Bay, where more than 500,000 king penguins move around, where you've got tens of thousands of seals, incredible scenery, and literally nobody going ashore other than for two to three months of the year. It's like stepping back 300 years and feeling what this planet felt like. And I, I, I can really say I felt more alive on that beach than I have anywhere on earth. And really it's a, a testament to what life used to be like on our planet and what life can still be like. It was in places like South Georgia that I really realized how important storytelling was and how life and death battles play out before you on an almost everyday basis. In this particular case, watching a group of several hundred, maybe even a thousand king penguins standing on a beach, getting ready to go into the ocean, and then lo and behold, an elephant, um, a leopard seal rushes up onto the beach and chases these king penguins up the beach, narrowly missing one, starting a stampede, and then watching these birds over the next, the next few hours undertake this incredible migration, where initially they would walk across these gravelly plains, then through rivers, glacial rivers. Finally, they would walk up little hills and mountainsides in their hundreds, like a re an army regiment, and then go down these glacial slopes, finally coming together on a beach and being ready to head back into the ocean, having evaded the leopard seal on the beach a couple of kilometers away, only to once again discover that there's another leopard seal waiting for them there. And these trials and tribulations of life play out before your eyes. And really it's a case of just opening, opening up yourself to being aware of them, documenting them, and you know, really respecting the life and death scenarios that play out essentially right in front of us. And on a similar vein, in Alaska many years ago, I think around about 2010 or so, we were doing a, a Discovery Channel documentary looking at salmon sharks, and we hadn't had much luck. And I, I was told that, well, look, the salmon sharks have disappeared. We've got another month here go out, you've, you've got a boat of your own, go out and see what you can find and, and photograph it. And it just happened to be during the salmon run. And I'd heard these stories of the incredible uh, ability of these salmon to find their natal stream over, you know, a, a maze of different opportunities. They come back to these small creeks and small rivers that sometimes are no more than 20 or 30 foot wide. And I watched these salmon literally fighting themselves up the river 
And I watched as pieces of skin were coming off them as they used the last vestiges of life to get up that stream to be able to spawn. And in the case of the males, fertilize that, the, the female's eggs and so ensure the next generation. And then seeing their bodies as they finally withered away with nothing left in them, littering the riverbanks. And I learned from the locals there how once those bodies broke down, they acted as a fertilizer for the trees and were an integral part of that nutrient load. And I realized just how interconnected everything was. And for not, photography for me was a, a means to not only expose that, but also, you know, be able to appreciate it and add a creative element to it. I think the time with the, that I've been lucky enough to spend with wildlife around the world has, has taught me so many different things and none more so than the great white. I don't think there's another animal on the planet that has as many different opinions about it. People love them, people hate them, but people feel incredibly strongly about them. And there's so many mis, well, poorly perceived ideas and misconceptions about these animals. And, you know, there was so often the adage that, you know, you get in the water of the great white shark, it's going to rush in and kill you. But having spent so many of my years in their company, both above and below the surface, I realized that what we told in the press is very, very different to the animal that I see in front of me. And I was able to interact with these animals in so many ways that were perceived as being dangerous. But in reality, once you get to know the animal, they actually have very, very little interest in you. And I was able to, in many occasions, to free dive with them, to kayak with them, to paddleboard with them. In fact, do everything that was initially perceived as life-threatening and these animals would rush in and kill me. But by beginning to understand them and understand their behavior and understand their mannerisms and body language, I was able to very safely interact with them and spent the most wonderful times with them. I was lucky enough to get to know this animal underwater in its environment. And as a, a guest once said to me, the great white shark doesn't move through the water. The water moves with the great white shark, such as the majesty and ease of movement of this animal in its own realm. I was lucky to have unprecedented opportunities to work with these animals as a documentary host, um, almost James Bond-like. Uh, I was able to go in little submarines and it wasn't quite the, the James Bond submarine that you, you would expect when somebody says they're going to send over a submarine to work with. I remember in this particular case, uh, I got sent this very strange looking little propelled uh, submarine or cage, whatever you want to call it. And it was great. You climb inside the thing, you put your head into that bubble. But uh, what they didn't tell me when they initially pitched the idea is that your backside sticks out. So it was great when the sharks were swimming in front of the, the submarine, but the moment they swam behind it, I can tell you, I, I clinched my buttocks pretty tight, but uh, yeah, it was a, a pretty special experience to encounter these animals like that. I also was able to design cages that allowed me to walk on the seafloor and see great white sharks in a way that very few people had, you know, to see them in their environment where I was able to be mobile enough to follow them and, and witness what they were doing down there was incredible. And I was lucky enough to do this on, uh, in a couple of different locations around the world and, and see how great whites differ from location to location. And not surprisingly, just like we have different cultures around the world, so great white sharks are exactly the same. But most importantly, aside from the incredible experiences of doing all these different things, I guess the, the greatest lesson for me was to simply observe these animals in their environment. And I was unbelievably privileged to work at a place called Seal Island in False Bay, where we discovered this amazing behavior where the great white sharks came breaching out the water. And by spending a huge amount of time with them, we saw how each season is cyclical. At certain times of the year, they do different things. They adopt different hunting strategies depending on the different seasons of the year. And one of the things I learned, and I already knew it from being a young boy and spending a lot of time with wildlife, but was so vividly reinforced, was to not always be amazed by the predator, but also have an unbelievable respect for the prey. And in the Cape Fur Seal, which was the prey in this particular case, I saw an amazingly adapted animal in its own right an animal that matched the speed and power of the great white shark with 
equal agility and endurance. And there, is, there were these incredibly beautifully matched battles between predator and prey. And over the course of 25 odd years, we recorded over 10 and a half thousand predatory events with the great white sharks having a success rate of about 49.6%. So an almost perfect balance. The seals in their own right were amazing survivors, defying all odds and showing that, you know, survival at all costs is what essentially drives nature. For me, it was an incredible um, privilege to not only see this, but also to learn more about it. A big part of what I did as a, as a naturalist was record all the data and worked with some very, very talented scientists who became friends and we wrote a whole host of scientific papers on this behavior. But from a photographic point of view, the knowledge that I gained from observing, chronicling, and then ultimately um, interpreting the data gave me a, a huge edge from a photographic point of view because ultimately the great white shark was a, an incredible um, chance for me to to school and, and and hone my skills in so much that you you're dealing with a subject that is invisible they're under the water you have no idea when they're going to come flying up you've got a prey that also spends a lot of time under the water when it's moving from point a to point b they move erratically you're moving on a boat that's got a lot of movement you're dealing with things such as spray and wind so there's a lot against you as a photographer that everything you get taught is to keep your camera still and um, what you really learned is to read animals' behavior. So having watched tens of thousands, hundreds of millions of seals moving, I learned very quickly when a seal moved in a certain way that was abnormal. And when something like this happens, it would immediately make me trigger a camera. So in this particular case, the seal has been porpoising along and then suddenly does a pronounced porpoise upright, which I knew was in, in reflex to a shark approaching. And if you have a look here, you'll see the two seals and the shark hasn't broken the surface yet, but here it comes flying out. So by understanding the behavior of my prey, I was able to better predict when the predator would come flying out. And this enabled me to um, get some photographs that I, 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 I hope do justice to this incredible predator and the amazing battles that it had with its prey. And once again, we saw incredible things, you know, in this case, we we're filming for planet Earth. And that seal used the shark's teeth as a final point of leverage to actually push itself out of the shark's mouth. And in this case, most incredibly, actually balancing on the snout of the shark to find death at the last possible minute. And being a predator, on roughly 50% of the occasions, they were successful. And over time, I realized that to capture truly different and um, novel images, I had to come up with ways of, of creating different perspectives. So we created little crafts that would allow me to really shoot at water level. I had some amazing encounters with curious sharks that would come and have a look at this craft. And unlike us who've got hands, sharks would bump things around and use their snout and their teeth to figure it out. And, and what people would generally find is terrifying. For me, I realized these sharks were just trying to find out what this was in the environment. They weren't aggressively engaging with me, but it was amazing using these different craft to capture different things. And in the beginning, this was the sort of image I was capturing. And yes, it, it undoubtedly helped my career hugely and, and, and you know paved the way for me to do a lot of things. But for me, really, I, I was more about trying to capture um, these animals in a beautiful way, a, a way that symbolized most of their life. And by being low to the water, that really allowed me to, you know, feel as though the viewer was in the water with them. Not everybody wants to swim with a great white shark or is comfortable in the environment. And for me, it was a, a privilege to, to do what I did. I never had formal photographic training. So Initially, I never knew when I was breaking rules and I loved the effect of shooting into the light. I never knew what the rule of thirds was when I first started out. So I simply took photographs that I felt pleasing and, and the, created the sort of effect that I really liked. And so that was kind of how my style evolved. But all the time, I was very, very conscious of elements and trying to tell the shark story. The great white shark is a truly beautiful 
animal. It's an incredible athlete. And in South Africa, we have magnificent skies. We have huge and moody seas. So I try to bring in all these elements into my imagery. I also started to realize that bigger wasn't always better. And the great white shark is part of a huge environment. So sometimes just showing this animal magnificently moving through its own environment was for me more beautiful than trying to just show the shark with its mouth open in a, in a highly predatory mode, which represents less than 1% of its life. And then trying to bring different elements together. So in this case, taking an, an image which almost looks like the sharks flying through the air, it looks like it's existentially transitioning between the elements of, of ocean and air. And I, I really like to show the animal in, a, in this way. It's, I feel it, it does the beauty and the majesty of this animal justice and really shows what it's like for most of its life. When I was photographing them hunting or breaching, I tried to bring in all those elements I spoke about. So clouds became very important to me. Um, different sea surfaces, bringing in elements where I was really close to the animal, accentuating the elevation above the, the sea surface, breaking that horizon line. That was really important. And then bringing in the elements of mountains or once again, the clouds in the background and, and really you know, add, adding mood and, and feeling to, to my images. Likewise, over here with these dolphins, getting down very, very low, shooting really at water level, letting that dorsal fin break the horizon that your eye is instantly drawn to it, and then bringing in those clouds that, that once again accentuate it. We started applying this to a variety of different animals we worked with. So what we learned by spending a huge amount of time around whales was that if we just turn the engines of our boat off, and let the whales choose to approach us. In most cases, these animals would be incredibly comfortable, in some cases curious, and allow me to get in the water or get very low angles where I could take shots where it really felt like you were under that huge five meter like fluke. And once again, by paying a huge amount of effort to looking at weather forecasts, choosing days to go out when I knew there would be clouds or those moody moody sort of backgrounds and shooting backlit. Uh, I was able to, cre to create images like this where you get that chandelier, breaking chandelier like feel of the water cascading off the whale's flukes. And then, you know, as the famous South African golfer Gary Player once said, the more I practice, the luckier I get. And that's certainly true in, in this particular case to have such a, a, a perfect uh, balance was, you know, uh, a, a case of luck. Yes, getting low helped me elevate that whale's tail and having the clouds, etc. But to have that balance of the whale perfectly symmetrical and, and uh, parallel to the ocean surface, that was a case of just being there and, and spending time out there. For me, I've always really tried to look through the elements. And uh, when I say look through the elements, you know, when I see bad weather coming, accept that it's bad weather, it's beautiful for certain things and shoot through those bad environments. I feel it, it creates a, a focus on your subject matter. It really tells you a lot about what the animal goes through. And I think it adds a, a very beautiful feel to the, the images. What I, I really, from a fine art point of view, try and do now is I try and keep my, my work very, very simple. I try and focus hugely on my backgrounds, not complicating images. And then I like to do things once again that I guess in many photographic circles are frowned upon. I like to shoot through things. So I love to shoot through the grass. And when I take a photograph like this, it's quite a lot of preparation goes into it. I'm very seldom in vehicles. I choose to go to places where I'm allowed to be outside of a vehicle. It's usually just my wife and I. So I can focus very carefully on my subject matter. I'm very, very careful in terms of interpreting body language um, because ultimately in some cases, my, you know, obviously your, your life may depend on it. And um, I'm always very respectful of the animals I'm working with. But from a creativity point of view, I love to bring in that soft feel that really draws the viewer into the, the, the focal point of my subject matter. Once again, in this particular case, shooting through the, through the grass, 
very shallow depth of field. Again, in this case, almost creating a feeling like flames around the line. And I, I just love the feel of bringing in that feeling of shooting through elements to create an image. And it's not always very comfortable um, lying in thorns, having many different species of ants climb up your pants. As my wife says, uh, I like to lie in the feces of many species, but uh, really it, it adds what I feel is a very different sort of feel and, and look to the imagery. And uh, yeah, you know, just taking various subjects and, and, and adding a, a soft focus to them. I pay particular uh, emphasis on my subject matter in terms of our I like to focus on the most magnificent of a species. I like to focus on iconic animals. Uh, I believe people understand and uh, you know are, are familiar with them. And then I like to tell their story in as beautiful way as I can. In the case of the great tuskers, there, there are only 30 of these great tuskers left on our planet. And you know, I, I, I really like to draw attention to that because we are losing them. And then I like to sometimes do things completely differently. In fact, one of the guides we work with in, in the Serengeti says I'm the, the only photographer who asks him to drive a, away from things. And, and quite often I do do that. I, I like to get a different perspective. I could have driven right up to these lines and, you know, got a beautiful portrait, but I, I like to create a very different sort of feel to, to my work. And uh, yeah, once again, in this particular case, shooting through the, through the glass to create that, that image. Um, in this particular case, bringing in different elements, once again, shooting through the dust. I, I seek out places that have got these raw ethereal feels to them. Uh, this, is a, this is in Northern Zimbabwe, where on many occasions we, we've seen the lions hunting and the, the buffalo stampeding. And really it creates a, a, an amazing atmosphere that I think draws any viewer to understand and respect the power of these animals, but also the, 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 the fear and the unification and, and strength that, that a herd feels. And then the, the element of a herd brings to keeping these animals safe. And then also I, I think, you know, when I've seen the lions rush into these herds where you have hundreds of buffalo running like that, the bravery of a lion, you know, you always hear as, as brave as the lion, but until you've actually seen them rushing into a stampeding herd like this, I don't think you can fully comprehend how brave those animals are. And, you know, speaking of bravery, watching the crossing of the Mara River, um, it's a photograph that's really been, been done to death, but what I try to pay particular attention to here instead of using a big lens where I could have isolated a, a group of those animals and, you know, got a, a whole throng of them crossing, I try to bring in the, the feel and the flow of these animals as they first enter the river in a stampede and then get caught by the current and the panic and fear of them as they get swept down and then desperately climbing out along the rocks, all the whilst having to dodge crocodiles. And then sometimes by bringing in elements there are certain components of a photograph that take a while to reveal themselves. And I, I call this particular one of my works natural selection. And uh, the, the reason for that is that this female is the leader of this herd of buffalo. She's been the one that's been brave enough to come over the lip of a gorge, lead a herd down, and then stand like the chosen one in this beam of light illuminating her where her herd that's trusting her judgment has followed her down. And the natural selection, obviously the, the title of the, the photograph comes from that to become the naturally selected one, many others have had to fall in her wake, almost like those souls that are left behind her. But she was just a, a magnificent exhibition of a brave, brave leader who safely, safely in this case, led a herd to water. I like to shoot through the elements as I do on land in the water to create a, a softer artistic feel. And you can see that it, it looks very, very different to when I'm just shooting the big, bold, uh, close-up images. I love that, that slightly softer feel and, and, and 
look to the marine images as well. Once again, a breaching whale shot from water level through water droplets next to the boat. And then very important to me, where I can get comfortably and respectfully close to animals is to create a sense of intimacy. These are with wandering albatross in South Georgia Island. As I mentioned, I was lucky enough to be part of a once every 10 year survey with just seven other people. And wow, what a privilege to sit next to these animals that can live up to 65 years, circumnavigate the globe in less than a month, mate for life, or fly 4,000 kilometers to bring home food home for their young, and then have them be completely unafraid of me, although 19 of their 23 species are threatened by my kind, to allow me this close to them, and then be right next to this male as he engages in a courtship display, a female lands next to him, and they do a series of bull clacking where with, by using a wide angle lens, he's got his huge 12 foot wings draped over me. After this, he came up to me and gently pecked at my camera and it was, yeah, it was, it was I don't know. I, I don't think you get experiences that are, are that much more fulfilling than that for me. And once again, getting really close to big, incredible elephants, in this case, a female we've worked with on many different occasions. And every time she's the, the matriarch of this herd, she'd leave the herd to where I was lying at the front of the vehicle, come up to where I was, setting the boundary of where she was comfortable with the herd, reach out with the trunk, gently sniff me, get into a big, bold posture, and then move back. And it, it was an amazing an amazing event for me in that she was saying, I know where you are. This is where your boundary is. Don't come close. I'm comfortable with you here. And it was, uh, yeah, just, just incredible to be tolerated in such a magnificent creature's presence. Once again, I seek out the most magnificent of their kind. It's, it's not by chance that this female was at the front of the herd. I, I spent a lot of time trying to position myself to get to a point where I was able to get a, a photograph of her. She, she led her, her herd across. And I love to bring in the elements, the raw elements that these animals find themselves in. You know, in the case of Amboseli, they're crossing a dry lake that in parts can be 20 kilometers wide. Um, the young have to do this sometimes once every two days. And it's an, an amazing show of survival and watching them cross this raw, hard, ethereal landscape is, is almost primeval. You know, it's like being there 10,000 years ago and you've got this encrusted earth with these beautiful, bold skies and then these elephants that have got crossed over scimitar giant tusks. It's a, it's a magnificent experience. And then getting really close to, you know, lions and in many cases, you know, having them walk towards me, in this case, in the central Kalahari, just fantastic. And, and in this case, you know, focusing on black maned lions, it's, I guess, the, the most sought after of, of all the lions to photograph is the black maned uh, gene. It's a, a gene that's sadly targeted by a lot of trophy hunters. And as such, you know, you, you don't see many of these animals anymore. And to have a, a beautiful black maned male walk towards me like this and shoot from, from ground level and then have him walk off the path and carry on around me was, yeah, once again, a very humbling experience. Likewise, you know, once again, to be in the water at, at close quarters, elevating this, this huge whale's tail above the surface and really accentuating the size of, of this, this truly huge creature. I mean, we all know whales are big, but when you, you know, not more than a, a couple of meters away and they raise their five meter wide flukes. Um, it, it's, it's just truly incredible how large they actually are. And then sometimes the story is huge, but it's subtle. And this is, looks like a beautiful breaking wave, but it was a particularly falcate or bent over dorsal fin of a humpback whale. And I, I just love the effect of this breaking wave on this animal's back. It is the, the whales are the symbol of the ocean. And I guess to carry a wave on your back just takes that symbolism a little bit further. Sometimes the tail is the tail itself. And in this particular case, what I, I really love about this is that is the whale's passport. That is, a, that is its, 
its basic story of its life told through its tail. So those scrape marks are bite marks from orcas that it's managed to dodge, duck, and defy throughout its life. Those little round uh, white specks are three different types of barnacles that occur at different latitudes. It tells you the whale's journey through different waters of the world. And that essentially is that animal's, animal's life um, written on its tail. So sometimes the more you learn about these animals, the more rich and interesting the experience as a photographer becomes. Whilst I primarily nowadays focus on black and white imagery, there is also a component where I love to bring in shades. And I, I try to keep this form of photography limited to just three or four colors. And I believe it's the simplicity of keeping it to a limited number of colors with relatively distracting backgrounds that, that really works. Um, they're parts of Northern Namibia. I chatted briefly to Jill beforehand, Itosha National Park. We've both spent a lot of time there. That really offers you these amazing opportunities. And at certain times of the year, I know to go to these parks when in this particular case, the Mapani trees are changing color. And it's almost like the, the fall shades in the Northern hemisphere. So in the Southern hemisphere, we, we get our autumn, our autumn colors. In fact, this is at the, at the end of winter going into, into spring. And you get these magnificent shades. Once again, I, I believe the power of the image is to keep it really simple. Um, the pleasing factor on the eye is that there, there's not a huge amount of distraction by way of, of many different colors. And once again, you know, just really focusing on a, a limited amount of shades. Again, here, yeah, just really three or four colors. And then bringing in, you know, a completely different feel to an image where sometimes the, the viewer's eyes is initially fooled into thinking those are leaves on a tree, but they're actually more than 500 lovebirds that have clustered like the leaves of the tree. I love to place a lot of emphasis on shape, texture, and, and form. Really, I love bringing in architectural elements into my work. And, you know, sometimes it's relatively simple in terms of, in this case, uh, essentially grace on granite, this beautiful leopard on this lovely round sculptured rock. But then sometimes just the pure form of the animal itself. In this case, an incredibly hydrodynamic mako shark, the fastest shark in the sea that's designed like a jet fighter. And to bring in that shape design, those beautiful different foils and the sculptured body of that animal. Um, yeah, I just love the form of, of these creatures. On a, a recent trip to Mexico, I took this image just three weeks ago where you've got a, a marlin with a tiny sardine balanced on the tip of its bull like a gladiator about to apply the coup de gras and just the the raw elements of of this massive wake of white behind it set off by uh, the contrast of the black and this incredible form and shape of this the swordsman this gladiator of the sea and then sometimes to just bring in the mood you know in this case the exhalation of this school of whales, almost like the exhaled ghosts of Davy Jones being let free above the, the surface of the ocean. And, and you know, anybody that sees that feels the, the peace and the sentience that the, these great creatures bring. From a fine art point of view, you know, I really try and focus on, on shape and form and, and to tell the story of of the sea and, and the animals that occur there and hopefully do it in, in, a, in an artistic way. A lot of people think that the life of a photographer is, is always glamorous and sure, it can be. You can stay at some of the most beautiful lodges in the world. But um, the reality for us and my wife and I is that we spend huge amounts of time either on the ocean or, or in the bush. And we do so in a very, very simple way. Um, I, I don't have a a lavish editing studio. Most times uh, I've got uh, all sorts of different things crawling around in our tent or scorpions under our shoes and often very inclement and hot weather. But that's really what I need to firstly get a feel of the environment I'm in to get to understand 
the dynamics of what's going on, be it, the, be it in the lion's case, how the pride is using the area where I might most likely can encounter it to get those animals comfortable with me. And then also it gives me a lot of chance to be on my own, spend time with the animals uh, together with my wife and just by spending time, be there at the right time. We've got to meet the most amazing people and become friends with incredible tribes throughout Africa where we we become part of their lifestyle and, uh, you know, embrace their culture and experience what it's like to live off the earth. And then, you know, to be in some of the wildest parts of, of Africa or other parts of the world on your own is, uh, you know, it's, it's incredible to, it touches your soul in so many different ways. But don't think it's not without its own trials and, and tribulations. Um, many is the time that things haven't quite gone as planned. We've been shipwrecked twice in the middle of the ocean. And in this particular case, in the middle photo, 200 miles off the Mozambican coastline, had lions around our tent, a little tent more times than I can remember, had huge tusker elephants reach out their trunk and sniff me. Lions tried to jump in the car, destroyed a car in an elephant hole where we had to walk 20 kilometers back to the ranger's office. So it certainly hasn't been a, a life without incident or, or, or crazy story. But what really drives me is, is to tell the story of our, of our planet. Um, I've been so lucky to spend so much time with these icons of our planet. And in 1996, I was so privileged to discover that amazing flying great white shark behavior that you know, became very well known around the world. But tragically, by 2018, due to gross human mismanagement in South Africa of the, a variety of their prey sources, by having an archaic system like the Natal Sharks Board that kills more great white sharks than any other, bycatch poaching, um, all these things combined now with the advent of, of pressure from uh, shark eating orcas, the white sharks have disappeared from the bulk of the South African coastline. So from discovering this amazing behavior of a creature that's been around for nearly 50 million years, exhibiting the most spectacular behavior in 50 million years, we've managed to screw it up and lose it in 22. So this was a really, a, I guess, a, a momentous time in my life that I realized I needed to do something with my work. I, I, I was gifted the privileged opportunity to see this showcase and take these photographs. But I started realizing that it wasn't just the great white shark. I traveled to both extremes, the Arctic and Antarctic. I'd seen two decades before unbelievably magnificent glaciers carving into the sea. And just 10, 15 years later, I went back to those same locations and suddenly there were three, four, 500 meter long chasms where the glaciers weren't there anymore. They'd been around for thousands, tens of thousands of years. But what I also started seeing in the most arid and hot places of the planet, in this case, one of them is in the northern Cape of South Africa, where daily temperatures can often exceed 50 degrees Celsius. And you've got the, the, the most strongest botanical warriors on our planet, in this case, the quirkaboom or the quiver tree, um, which survives these incredibly hostile climates and Bushmen or the Khoisan would have used, probably used that self same tree three, 400 years ago to fashion their quivers and then been surrounded by trees such as euphorbias and others that are equally hardy in just the last 12 years, bearing in mind that survived decades and centuries of extremes, they cannot keep up with the change that is happening. So for me, it became extremely important to not only showcase these things, but also tell the narrative surrounding my work. And then also through raising funds through the sale of my work, donate to organizations such as Wild Aid and others like the Zambezi Elephant Fund and Bush Life that I know from firsthand experience are making huge changes to our planet. And then in my own small way, together with my wife using funds from our work, to buy land in Southern Africa and both South Africa and, and in upcoming in Namibia to preserve habitat because I believe that our younger generation is more enlightened, but they really need us to make sure there is something for them to inherit. And in, in no small way, I'm incredibly privileged, 
thankful and feel amazingly gifted to have the opportunity to talk to many of you. And I know in, in many cases, I'm talking to the choir and many of you, you realize this, but I think as photographers, we have such a huge part to play in using the gift that is photography to tell the story to those who may not be as privileged as us to see these beautiful parts of the world and inspire people to realize that yes, we have lost a hell of a lot, but there is still so much worth saving. And thank you so much this evening for giving me the opportunity to share my work, my story and um, showcase it to all of you who I know love the, the art of photography, certainly if, if not more than I do. So thank you very much. Chris, you're more than welcome. Thank you very, very much for, for that presentation and for those marvelous images and, and the information that you had to tell about each of them. And as I mentioned earlier, if anybody has any questions, please uh, put them into the chat facility and, and I'll pass them on to Chris. Uh, Chris, the um, reaction so far in the chat has been absolutely fantastic. People uh, are uh, just saying how, how wonderful your images are. But what I was wondering is for you, which came first, um, your interest in nature or your interest in photography? I, I would be lying if I said it wasn't nature. Um, my earliest exposure to wildlife was being chased up a tree by warthogs. And that's the first thing I remember in my, my life. And I've always had a love of, of nature first and the photography became an extension of a way to, to share that love with people. And yeah, I mean, I, I love photography now, but um, always will be animals first. Okay. Um... And I've, I've noticed that um, a lot of your images, especially your later images, are in black and white. Whereas I think a lot of people would think if you're going to be taking photographs of nature, that you'd be doing it in colour. So, so what um, inspired you to do the conversion to monochrome? I, I like the, when you're putting it together, a portfolio, I like, in my case, to have uniformity to it. I believe black and white is timeless. I believe it's classic. And I believe it also reflects history. And in many cases, many of my subjects are no longer with us. So sadly, they've been relegated to the, the pages of history. And I think black and white kind of is a chronology of, of history in many ways. So I think they fit in very well with that. And I think many of the images and the way I shoot them nowadays lend themselves to black and white. But having said that, um, there, there is always a part of me, you know, when you're shooting something that's got vivid colors, I, I, I do sometimes struggle to turn them to black and white. I, I, undoubtedly, I do. But from a uniformity point of view and for all the reasons I mentioned, I think, you know, there's a lot of symbolism in, in, in what I'm trying to, trying to do by way of telling a story. And I believe the black and white really sums that up very succinctly. Okay, hey, thank you. And um, some technical questions. Some people have been wondering about your equipment. So what cameras and what lenses do you use? Okay, so currently I'm shooting with two R5s, um, Canon R5s as, as the bodies, and then I use a Canon 5D Mark IV in my underwater housing. And then lens-wise, when I'm on the boat, my go-to lens, in fact, my go-to lens, ironically, for both the boat and the bush is a 70 to 200. I do have 600s, 200 to 400. Of, you know, I've got most of the big lenses, but on a boat, because you're moving so much, a big lens, unless it's un unbelievably calm, I might take a 200 to 400 to see, but usually I'm pretty close to my subjects. I love the 70 to 200. And in the bush, I'm generally pretty close to my subjects as well. So if I'm not, if I'm, if I have to, I'll probably shoot to the 200, 400. I still love the feel of, you know, 600 F4, I love that bokeh and I love, you know, the, the soft feel when you're shooting at F4. But um, yeah, generally 70 to 200, I love wide angle lenses, um, 11 to 24 um, with, the, with the mirrorless now, 15 to 35, I'm shooting with that quite a lot. So yeah, the two R5s, it was, it was quite a, a big transition um, to go from DSLR to, to mirrorless. But yeah, I, I, love, I love the camera. I love the versatility of it. I love the ability, you know, to really move that focus point around anywhere on, the, on, your, 
your screen. Um, from a creative point of view, I, I loved what that that gave gave me. Um, so yeah, for now those those cameras worked really well for me. Okay, and um, what, what what intrigues me is, 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 is as you're saying there that you use the wide angle lenses, which means you're obviously getting very very close into some of your subjects. Um, when you're underwater, I presume you have the cameras in housing, but they're not waterproof cameras, are they? No, so you're using a housing and, and underwater, you generally want to be really close to your subjects because you want to have as little water between you and your subject matter as possible. So underwater, I shoot with an eight to 15 millimeter lens, usually shot at 15 millimeters. And the reason why you want to be close to your subjects is obviously in the water, you get a lot of particulate. So a lot of broken down material. And the further something is away, obviously the less clarity there is. So you want to be close to your subjects you're shooting a camera inside a housing, and then instead of having a, a flash, which I, you know, when I'm in a terrestrial environment, I very seldom use it. I rely on natural light. Underwater, obviously, you don't have nearly as much light, and you do you do uh, need it just to bring a little bit of full lighting and give a little bit of contrast to to your subject. So underwater, I use strobes, um, two strobes equally balanced on either side of the housing, and yeah, it's. I think for a lot of people that are more familiar with shooting on a terrestrial basis, um, the, the thought of going underwater and, and acquiring a whole new skill set is quite intimidating. But the reality is it's, it's not actually that, that challenging. And if you apply a few simple uh, concepts, you, you can start taking pretty decent images quite quickly. It's just a case of becoming comfortable in the water, really. Whether you're in the water or whether you're on land, how do you manage um, to focus so accurately uh, with moving subjects? I mean, do you use burst mode or focus tracking or some sort of system like that? Yeah, so you're uh, under both underwater and above water. I'm generally obviously with fast moving subjects so shooting in servo mode. Um, the new R5 has got an amazing eye tracking system that works incredibly well with things like birds. Ironically, the biggest land animal like an elephant, it, does, it doesn't find their eyes, so it doesn't work that well. But the autofocus in, in general terms is, is still, still amazing. So I rely on the autofocus of the cameras because I believe all the modern cameras, be it Canon, which I obviously use, but Nikon, um, Sony, all, all the all the top cameras, you know, that the autofocus is really, really great. So I rely on autofocus. Um, generally, you know, burst mode. I have to say, however, you know, um, there are instances where I still do shoot a lot of action photography and I cut my teeth essentially shooting flying great white sharks. But nowadays for the fine art side of things, I'm, I'm quite often shooting slower subjects and you know, really fast shutter speed isn't as important as it used to be. Now it's more a case of very carefully planning my backgrounds, um, moody elements such as going to certain places when I know there's going to be dust or when I know there's a chance of really interesting and, and contrasty sort of clouds. Uh, so your mindset and the way you shoot changes dramatically. Backgrounds are vitally important to me. Um, so yeah, I, I, I pay less attention to that incredible high frame rate as I do to very carefully um, considering where, when, and how I'm going to compose an, an image. Okay. Uh, one other technical question that's come in is, is Pro Capture available on your camera? And do you use it, especially with the shark images? Is Pro Capture? Yes. Yeah, I don't uh, even know what Pro, I don't even know what Pro Capture is, so you're gonna have I, to tell me. I, I must admit, I don't either. It's somebody has put that question in for us. So it's, that's a new one on me as well. So I take it the answer to the question is it's not available. You don't use it. <laughs> it, could, it could well be. I might have just, I might just not have read that part of the manual that well. Yeah. yeah. I, I suspect it's some software um, that is used, but it's not one I'm familiar with at all. I'll, I'll that, be reading up. Yep, yeah, definitely. And one other question uh, when you're out in the bush, obviously there's fantastic electricity supply out in the bush <laughs> or not. So I'm just wondering, how do you manage to do things like run your laptops, power up your, uh, your the camera batteries and so on? That's challenging. Um, when we in certain places, certain national parks, it's really easy. You um, 
you can plug in, they, they plug their electrical sockets and, and units. So it's as, as simple as being at home. But lots of places we go to, um, by way of example, the central Kalahari, uh, which is in the heart of Botswana. It's 55,000 square kilometers, the world's second largest game reserve. You can be 100 kilometers away from the next human being. You have to be completely self-sufficient. So in our vehicle, we have a dual battery system. Um, and then I plug an inverter into the dual battery system that allows me to, to run my batteries off it. But you faced with a dilemma in that because you're in these environments for sometimes two, three weeks at a time, you have to ration your fuel very carefully. So you can't drive very long distances to charge up your battery, you know, with an alternator of the car. So it becomes a case of very carefully managing your systems. Um, but over time, you, you generally figure out how to do that and you have to, you have to forsake certain things. You know, we, we do have a, a, a freezer that we take, but you, you learn to run the freezer um, very differently to how you would at home. So you, you basically, you know, when the car's running, you run it. When it's not running, you, you don't run it. And you, you just learn to live very differently. But you... you utilize what you have available by way of the inverter and what power power you know you're drawing and yeah you take a you take quite a few batteries with you that on days where you do drive a long way you know you power it up on on those days so a lot of planning uh, obviously is involved in, in doing all of that um, absolutely another question that's come in is about using your camera do you use it in auto iso mode or would you manually set the iso so I do both. Um, and underwater, where I might be changing direction multiple times, um, I don't generally set manual there. I'll, I'll, I might choose my aperture and I might choose my, my f-stop, but I, I'll leave, leave it up to auto ISO, where I know I am going to be in a fixed position, specifically, for instance, say, shooting into the light, I might do everything manually, and then just play around with my exposure compensation. So different circumstances call for different things, and I use both methods of entirely shooting on, on manual or occasionally, well, not occasionally, more often than occasionally relying on auto ISO. Okay, thank you. I actually think we've come to the end of the questions that are here. So if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, we can see all the people and it will give us an opportunity then to say to you on behalf of everybody who's been here this evening a, a very very big thank you for taking the time to be with us for sharing your images and, and your insights and, and all the fantastic information that you shared with us and on behalf of everybody uh, especially picking up on the comments over here i'd just like to say it's been absolutely fantastic with some some utterly amazing images incredible work and we really really do appreciate it so i'm going to say let's have a round of applause now you probably won't hear anybody but we'll, we'll see a few hands making the sounds so thank, thank you. you thank you very much chris it's been absolutely wonderful having you join us um, before before we go uh just on behalf of, of the fia border directors and the fia photo academy we're coming to the end of of this year so i'd just like to wish everybody uh, a very happy holiday season coming up now and um we and also a happy new year and we will see you again in january because we are planning our schedule for events which will be taking place from january onwards and for those of you who are going to the fiat congress in asturias in a few weeks time uh, we will see you there as well but until then and until next year we wish you all very much the best and uh, hope you all keep safe and keep well. And uh, I'd say good evening and goodbye to everybody now. So thank you, thank you very, much. All very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.